Hello everyone and welcome to Sci-Fi Zone where we celebrate science fiction movies and TV shows from the past, the present and the future. I'm here today with Claire and EPS and we're coming to you from the wonderful comic book store of alternate worlds. A few episodes ago we actually had a discussion about science fiction number plates that can go onto your car. So let's just change that around and say, well, if you've got the science fiction number plate, what car would you put it on? Which then brings up the question of science fiction movies and TV shows that actually feature cars, real life cars. And if you've got the money, you can actually buy and or build one of these yourselves because they're on the ground, they've got the wheels. And EPS is going to share a few examples uh, with us of cars that uh, have appeared in movies and shows. Originally he was going to talk about flying cars and I just shot him down in flames on that one because it's like you can't build a flying car that's going to fly well, but can, cars you, on wheels can go. Well you can build it, it doesn't have to fly. It just, what's the just, point? What could they, I mean, there's plenty of cars. <laughs> Let's stay earthbound. <sighs> Relax. What have you got for us? Because I thought the top of your list has got to be the Batmobile and all 10,000 variations of it. Well yeah the Batmobile's there but we can talk about Batmobiles later on. You could have a whole session on Batmobiles. I could do a whole year on Batmobiles. <laughs> uh, uh, some of the more fun ones, I think, and a bit more uh, notorious. There's Kit from Knight Rider. I loves Kit. Yeah. Which is more bound to the future technologies we're going to have where cars are driverless and... Mm. Talk back to you. Potentially it's getting closer and closer to reality. Well, that, that and iRobot, the car in iRobot, yeah. yes. the Audi there, that's a driverless car. That's even car. closer, yeah. So yeah. They're, they're getting there. Uh, Kit had a mind of his own, mm. so... That was also fun to, to deal with. I remember the pilot episode where Michael Knight goes, well, if you can drive, I'm just going to have a nap and just curls up and the cops pull him up. And, and he goes, well, hang on a second. Uh, were you driving? He goes, uh, sort of. no. There was actually a fantastic scene in uh, Knight Rider 2 where it's a top-down view of the car driving on the road and kids saying to Michael, Michael, you're going to crash. You're going too fast. You're going to crash. And you cut inside the car and he's actually playing a computer game, a car racing game on the console and the car's driving itself. <laughs> that was very, very funny. Yeah. But uh, yeah, everybody loves Knight Rider. And I think it's because yeah. of the, the eye at the front, the whole Silent Centurion thing that really, really sold it. Even though it really didn't need that, it just looked good. It was totally purposeless. It was also really. the personality. I mean, that car had a... Oh, Great yeah, personality. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely, yeah. That, no. I think, really made it. Yep, absolutely, yeah. yep. All right, we'll jump to the DeLorean, which is everyone's yes. favourite time-travelling Now, car. here's a question. Did anybody even realise that DeLorean Motor Company even existed before Back to the Future? I don't think... I've never heard of them. Uh, in this country, they never got released in this country. No. So it would have been like, what the hell's a DeLorean? Because the funny thing with DeLoreans, of course, is they're stainless steel. They weren't painted. But the whole company went out of business many, many years ago prior to uh, Back to the Future. And it's almost like got a rebirth mm. just from that one movie. Who would have thought? Because at the time, it was like, really? A DeLorean? And they look pretty cool. So They're probably pretty cheap to, to get your hands on one. So they probably went yeah. through a few. Yeah. yeah the filming of the three it. films. So Yeah. Uh, the other one that I really love, which I re-saw a few years ago was Auto Man's car, so from the TV series Auto Man, but the actual car in it was a Lamborghini Contage. Oh yes, I actually did. <laughs> so and they put all these highlights on it and yeah. all this sort of stuff, so they're actually looking at a picture of it right now, so yeah, they didn't do things That's on cool. the cheap, that's for sure, a Lamborghini Contage, very, very, very cool. The only thing that Lamborghini couldn't do, or like that could do in the show, which you can't do in real life, is the right angle turns. Oh yeah. <laughs> and the guy inside would just squash up against the window from the G4s, yeah, yeah exactly right. So, um, but uh, that's a very, very, very groovy one, actually. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I love the series. And if they now is the time to remake that series because you've got so much more technology and so many more things you could actually do with it, mm. uh, and you could change it to different cars. I reckon yep. that would be just yeah, as, yeah. as more mm, interesting. Yeah, then yeah. Uh, we have the Fab One, Lady <laughs> Penelope's car. Yes, the one pink giant Rolls pink Rolls Royce. Royce, exactly right. Which uh, for the show, Rolls Royce actually approved them actually making yeah. a uh, using Rolls for it. But for the movie, the live-action movie that Jonathan Frakes directed, uh, Rolls um, said, I think, no, wasn't yeah. it? They completely oh, changed wow. the design. Kept the six wheels, but changed the design completely. And not, not nice, not pleasant no, at all. You no, know, they ruined the aesthetic of it entirely, and uh, which shame. is very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, it was very unfortunate because uh, I'd heard that actually at the premiere of Thunderbirds I Go, <laughs> I think it was, um, they tried to build a, not Rolls, but uh, the production company, Jerry Anderson & Co, tried to build a uh, full-scale version of Fab One, and it broke down not long <laughs> after uh, heading towards the cinema and apparently Rolls weren't very happy with the fact that uh, uh, they tried to do a reproduction because with Rolls-Royce remember as the engineer once said Rolls-Royces do not break down they might on occasions fail to proceed so there you go <laughs> 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 that's a true story too by the way oh, uh, right. golly. We'll, we'll move on from yeah. the Rolls-Royce any other cars because I've got a couple I can chuck in yeah oh, I'll chuck in the Batmobile 
pick a version of the Batmobile. Probably the two favor the three favourites are the 66 Batmobile, yeah. the 89 Keaton, and the Tumbler. Uh, in terms of film film ones, yeah. uh, there are many more in the comic books, but these are the, the best ones uh, for film. And I think it's safe to say that the 66 one in particular is very iconic, and you can oh, buy yeah. replicas of them. There's a company in America who actually build them one to one scale, drivable, the whole lot with all the bells and whistles. Wow. So uh, don't come cheap. But you uh, can certainly get them if you, you can like have them. One of three different versions that goes from cheap to medium to quite expensive. Yes. But yeah, you can have one. So if you uh, want to sell a kidney, you can go out and buy yourself a Batmobile. <laughs> so there you go. Um, there's a couple that I've thought of in my travels, which are kind of groovy. Uh, I've never. I never actually watched this episode, well these episodes, Bessie from good old Doctor Who. So how cool was that? The Doctor had his own car with the number plate Who won, I recall, from the yes. show. So how groovy was that? Yep. You did that, didn't you? Being a Doctor of Who course. aficionado. Absolutely. Other ones, of course, are from Mad Max. You had your Pursuit, you had your Interceptor. Mad Max cars were very, very groovy and of course they made a whole lot of them for uh, the second movie and in particular uh, Fury Road. So, uh, but yeah, everybody mm. loved the old Pursuit. And of course you can build replicas of these if you want because they're all based on Ford Falcon uh, bodies. So uh, just add a few bits here and there and you can pursue yourself off into the unknown. So how good is that? And the last one I can think of, uh, this is one actually, uh, Ange, the guy who sits in the back way over there, picked up was Ark 2. The RV, the big RV from uh, the series Arc 2. Did you ever watch that from the 70s? No. These dudes rolling around the countryside. I don't remember it very, very, very no, well, but it was well. a custom built thing. And the thing about Arc 2 is if you look at it, there are no windows in it, right? So if you're filming interior scenes, you can make it like the TARDIS, oh. make it the size of a house if yeah. you want, because you can't see out the windows, so you don't have to look outside. It could be any size out there. So. Uh, there you go. So what goes to show is there are plenty of cars to, uh, to look at in your movies and TV shows. How good is that? Have you got any more cars you want to chuck in? Johnny Cab. Johnny oh, Cab. Yes. Yeah, Johnny good old Johnny Cab. Cab. Yes, I love it. There you go. Hell of a day, isn't it? <laughs> Welcome to Johnny Cab. <laughs> Please oh, state God. your destination. Just jive. Jive. <laughs> oh, we need a drink. Right, yeah. Just go. Jive, will you? <laughs> Do you reckon... Uh, do you reckon that would actually work in real life to actually have a physical artificial being built into the into the taxi? Because well, you've got driverless cars now. I was so. going to say, it's not the way we're going. No. Like, that's not what's proposed for any of the driverless cars. No, no. There's a seat there for a person. Yes. Not not, uh, not a <laughs> token Cap, robot. How gross is that? Oh, absolutely fantastic. Well, while you sit back and think of some science fiction cars that you've seen in movies and TV shows, we're going to take a bit of a break. So. Uh, Make sure you uh, come back uh, straight after this and we'll see you in a few ticks. Okay, don't go away. Alternate World has been specialising in comics and collectibles for over 40 years. With a back issue collection of over half a million comics covering the golden age right through to latest releases, including signed and slabbed gems. They also have an enormous graphic novel collection, one of the largest ranges of manga in the country, as well as toys, statues and pops, and new items are arriving every Wednesday. Each month, Alternate Worlds hosts its own premium comic day, where all the rare treasures are put on display for inspection and purchase. The store also runs regular tournaments and competitions for both comic and gaming fans. And for local and interstate and international buyers, the Alternate Worlds website features their complete range of products. So whether you come in online or in store, visit them soon. Welcome back to the show. As you know, we primarily talk about movies and TV shows, but there's actually been a lot of movies that have actually been inspired by books and novels. Now, whether they be from over 100 years ago with H.G. Wells writing The Time Machine and War of the Worlds, two things that are a lot more recent. A good example about how movies uh, come from books is how things get changed. Some people think the books are better than the films. Sometimes the films are forced to make changes that um, a lot of the readers aren't very, very happy about. A good example is actually A Clockwork Orange, where the last chapter of the book was completely missed out from the movie. And in the book, if you know the book quite well, Alex, who's the uh, antagonist of the movie, gets redeemed in the 21st chapter. But Stanley Kubrick read the American version of the book where that chapter was missing. So at the end of the movie, Alex is still a bad guy, effectively, which is a pretty significant change to the story. Mm. So depending on which version you've read, you could be saying, well, hang on, that's actually not true. 
or you could say, yes, that's, act that's actually the best way it could have finished. I don't know if you knew that or not. So uh, no. there you go. Claire's our resident, resident book reader here, <laughs> so she knows more about the books than I certainly do. But that, I think, is a really, really good example of where a significant change has occurred between the film version and the literary uh, version. And that happens uh, quite a lot. It does. So, yeah. Um, other examples, of course, is the movie I, Robot, where <laughs> the story is completely different. To, uh, to the book, but aside from the three laws of robotics, um, everything else is pretty much different, isn't it? Well, they use the names of some of the characters and there are some characteristics of them. Um, there's one scene that I love that's from the book where he's sitting there making himself a cup of tea or coffee, I can't remember which, yeah. and he puts like six spoons of sugar in it. Yeah. That's out of the book. <laughs> but aside from that, not a whole lot. Um, but the, the book was originally a series of short stories. Yes. So the story that we're told actually has elements from a number of those yes um but it's but it's quite different it's not it's definitely not uh, a direct take of any of the stories mm. so that's quite interesting but it has a lot of the concepts it has you know the idea of robots being built to help people and and the, the three laws of robotics of course um is a fairly substantial contribution i think mm. um but yeah the the movie the story in the movie is not not even remotely of close. And of course, that throws a lot of people off who go, well, it's a remake of the book or it's a, an adaption of the book, and yeah, it's not. So no. it starts off with the three laws of robotics and then it goes in a completely different direction. So, yeah, yeah that doesn't always work for uh, devotees of the book. Um, uh, Dune is another example where they had to make changes uh, in the film. This is the 85, 84 version, sorry, uh, from the book. The most logical and most obvious one is that the Fremen in the book have to wear complete hoods, face masks, because obviously you're saving all the moisture yeah. and you sweat out all this moisture and they yeah. realise when they're making the movie, hey, if you put hoods on everybody, you don't know who anybody yeah. is. So they had to leave their faces exposed, even though you're losing all this moisture and sweat from your face, yeah. which they can't capture and they were forced to do that, which was actually quite interesting. So uh, imagine being put into that predicament and saying, well, we can't yeah. be completely true to life to the book because if we do that, no one is going to know who anybody is. Yeah. So, um, Blade Runner from Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, yeah. for the short story from Philip K. Dick. And I think if I recall, the interesting thing about that is about the idea of whether androids, this was like the iRobot thing yeah. about being self-aware and living in a world where everything is completely artificial, which is very, very similar to Blade Runner because the word Blade Runner doesn't appear in the novel at all. And of course, <laughs> the, uh, the key thing about uh, the actual novel is that Rachel, uh, in the book, actually knows she's a replicant, whereas in the movie, yeah. she doesn't, uh, which I thought was actually quite, quite significant because in the film, that's a big deal. Yeah, one of the ones I wanted to talk about was I Am Legend which has been yes. made into a movie three different times. Richard Matheson, yes, exactly yeah. right. Um, he wrote the screenplay for the first one, hmm. um, but the second, which was called The Last Man on Earth, and then it was made into another one called Omega Man, and then the most recent one was called I Am Legend. And the biggest difference with that is in the book, um, they're not so much zombies. They're, the people who are infected can still talk and communicate. Yes. And they hmm. are trying to persuade him to join them. Um, they don't want anyone to be left behind. And so rather than it being him against the world, just fighting these mindless, brainless zombies, um, it's much more intellectual. It's much more of a conversation. It's much more about how you would feel being the last person yeah. on Earth, which I thought was quite interesting. Mm. Yeah. That would almost make the Amiga Man almost closer to the It is closer. Book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. The Charlton Heston version from the 70s. So yeah. how good is that? So there you go. Uh, another significant one is actually uh, the inspiration for Planet of the Apes. Now, the book was called Monkey Planet uh, from Pierre Boulay. Now, the irony, of course, you're right, in the movies, the term monkey is actually classed as an, as a, uh, an offensive term mm, uh, yeah. to the apes. But in the story, of course, they have the astronauts um, who have found this um, message in a bottle, which when they read the message, it's actually from a guy who's a, a human, uh, is a Frenchman, actually, they're actually mm. speaking French, which is, you know, you've got to get your head around that. And it pretty much outlines what occurs in the, in the Charlton Heston movie. But of course, at the end of the book, it turns out that the two astronauts are actually apes, and they don't believe that humans could ever communicate or write or have any semblance of intelligence, so they actually don't believe it. But that was an interesting, very interesting mm. twist. And of course, as we mentioned a couple of episodes ago in the animated series of Planet of the Apes, the ape civilization was a lot more technologically advanced, which is what uh, occurs in the book. But that I thought was a very, very interesting one. So, but yeah, so they're actually reading this message from this person, this human, who's trying to teach French 
to apes. Can you imagine apes speaking French? It's a ooh la la. <laughs> That's just a bit of a, a, bit of a well, ooh, 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 ooh la la. <laughs> ooh la la. <laughs> it's not really any more ridiculous than teaching I speaking know, English. I know, I know. It would just take, take a bit of getting used to that, for sure. Yeah. So uh, I reckon that's actually quite funny. It's so. interesting, that idea between with, with the book, you can, you can tell people this is how it is, this is, this is what works, this is what doesn't. But when you're making it into a movie, you have to find a way to show it to them. You can't just say, well, there's this, this and this. Yes. You've got to show them how it is and show them why it's that way and that sort of stuff. And that, that, that's often what it is. That's often why things are changed because mm. it's, a lot diffi- it's difficult to, to sort of get into that uh, thought process in a movie. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Total Recall was yes. actually from a book called uh, We Can Remember, we can it, remember for it For You, you wholesale. wholesale by another yeah. Philip K. Dick story. It, it, look, it's a while since I've read it, um, but there are more elements of what happens in the book in the second version than there are in the first version. Um, I really liked the first one. Um, and I hadn't read the book before I saw the first one, but I read it subsequently yep. and then read it again before the next one came out. And the story is actually quite a bit closer. There's a lot of stuff in it that isn't in the book, that yep. whole going through the middle of the earth yeah, to, yeah, sure. to get to work thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not in the book. Um, but that's a short story as well. That's not yep. a novel. Um, so they've expanded on it. Mm. Yeah. So it's quite, it's quite interesting that the original was a lot further away and the new one has actually gone... Cool. back towards what the book is. And of course, one uh, movie, well, let's go for a series for this one, uh, which I know Claire will absolutely adore, was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> that was that was a, a really good, tra- at least the uh, 80s series was, you think, a very good, faithful adaption. The series was great. Adaption. The yeah. movie I didn't like so no, much. No, I understand that. Um, although Douglas Adams had something to do with writing the script. Yep. And the interesting thing about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is it, it's an iterative story. The original was actually a radio play. Yep. And then he wrote one or two of the books. And then it was made, and then he wrote it as a series of LPs, believe it or not. Um, and then he wrote some more of the books. And, and, it, and every time he wrote it for a different medium, it changed. So the BBC series is actually probably the closest thing to the books. Um, but the movie mm. is almost a completely different yeah, story again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the characters are, well, the names of the characters are there, mm. but some of the characters have changed. Yep. Some of them are similar, some of them are quite different. So uh, I find it really interesting with the Hitchhikers because there are so many versions of it, and most of them written mm. by the same guy. So he's, he's wanted to tell it yep. slightly differently every time, and differently and different in every medium. Yep. Yeah, I find that fascinating, and I have copies of all of them <laughs> at wow. home, including the LPs, which are actually quite hard to find now. Very, very groovy. Yeah. And not just novels themselves, but graphic novels have done the same yes. thing. Yeah. So you can look at the comic book side of things and graphic novels have done very similar. So mm-hmm. most f- so, uh, superhero films don't look anything like what their graphic no. novel is. So yeah, it's not just um, Books without pictures, <laughs> and I like books with pictures. <laughs> yes. Some people do it. No, There's nothing wrong right. with that at all. So <laughs> no, there you go. And just to clarify, one final thing: a lot of people think that 2001: A Space Odyssey was actually from the book 2001: A Space Odyssey, and that's actually not true at all. Uh, it was roughly based on uh, The Sentinel by yes. Arthur C. Clarke, yeah. and the book 2001: A Space Odyssey was being written as the movie was being produced. So a lot of people have a tendency of mixing that, mixing that up. So there you go. Uh, are there any others that you sort of want to bring up? Oh, I mean, uh, there's a huge long there's list. There's a long list. <laughs> there's there, a yeah. very long list. No, exactly right. Uh, here's one for you. <laughs> Starship Troopers, the Robert Heinlein uh, mm-hmm. book. Yes. Um, Paul Vohaven, Vohaven, the guy who made the movie uh, Starship Troopers, didn't even finish the book. He said he was bored with it after a few chapters. He said, nah, don't like it. <laughs> well, it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, di- it's written in a very different way from the movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it just goes to show. But uh, there'll always be people out there who uh, prefer one over the other and good luck to them too. So uh, uh, if you get a chance, by all means, um, look at both versions, whether they be books or the films. I mean, yeah. one of the ones I find funny, so what are we going to say? No, I was just going to say, you quite often get different things from them. Yeah. Um, uh, my, my automatic instinct is to say that the book is always going to be better than the film. Yep. But now that's becoming less and less true, I think. Yep. Um, because they can do different things in films that they don't yep. think of doing necessarily in books. Um, but... But I think I think personally it's worth reading the book and yep. watching the film because you get something different out of each. What I find interesting is the book War of the Worlds. So back in the 1800s when it was written, it made a lot of sense. The Martians came down, 
they get exposed to our environment and the germs and the bacteria kill them. Yeah. But you base it on like today, and of course you'd be asking these questions, well, didn't they do a soil sample first? Didn't they walk out with like spacesuits on and just yeah. instead of just barging out and not even protecting their ships and whatever else from um, the parasites and bacteria and all this sort of stuff? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, that, I th that concept has been uh, severely dated in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. Which is a bit of a shame because it works so well for the story. But yeah, like when you watch, say, the Tom Cruise version, you'd be going, it doesn't make any sense at all. Why would they just come running out, you know, with nothing on, no helmets or anything, going, we're having a great time here, this is the aliens. And of course, what happens, they, they catch a cold and they all I'm not sure it was it's like, <laughs> it's like, It's like, didn't even think of that. It was like, yeah, but so. The, but the other thing is, I mean, if you're talking about like scientific method and that kind of yeah. stuff, obviously we've improved things since that time. Yep. But it's also about you don't know what you don't know. Mm. I mean, maybe they thought they had done sufficient research. And when we go to Mars, for example, we, we're probably going to think we have done sufficient research, but that's a big planet and yep. we're not going to be able to explore every yeah. part of it before we get there. Anything could happen that we have just not been aware of, that we've not thought about. True, but I can't imagine anybody going to Mars walking out without a spacesuit on or a helmet going, hey, here I am. Well, no. <laughs> no. I'm ready to party. Once you put your hand in the thing <laughs> and, the, uh, and the air comes out. Oh, dear. Just yeah, remember, right. get your ass to Mars. Yeah, start Terrifying. the reactor. How good mm. is that? Very good. All right, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, mm, have a drink. Very, 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 very My good. My question is, would you want to see everything that was written in the book on film? No, not Would you want to see? Not necessarily. Air, why not? Sometimes they do have to cut things out for pacing um, and uh, just purely because it's laborious. And you can show instead of tell. Like mm. sometimes you'll read half a chapter that's really just explaining the background. You can show that in two or three pictures. Yeah. Um, it, it's, yeah. But so always, June's a good example of that. It'll always be an argument though whether there should be a direct uh, correlation between the two. Hey, if you yeah. like that sort of thing, just read the novelisation. And for all the intents and purposes, it's usually there as close to the movies you'll ever get. So. Yeah, but novelisations aren't often written no, I, for yeah. movies that already have a book. I'm sort of having a get, I'm having a gag, yeah, it's, it's all good, no dramas at all. Although sometimes a novelisation does tell you stuff, like in Batman Returns. No, that's true. It tells yeah. you how the Penguin got the plans for the Batmobile. Yeah. You know, and there's a whole half a chapter on yeah. that, on yeah. the backstory. So, but sometimes it can they be useful. They can fill in the gaps. Yeah, yeah, some of the Star Wars books have the same thing. Yeah. Exactly right, which is all very exciting stuff. <laughs> so get out there, start reading, but don't do that yeah. until you've seen the movies. What can I say? Um, <laughs> so we have to bring our episode to a close. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell for all the latest updates, reminders, and everything that's going on around the place. Next week, we're actually going to be discussing time travel movies, and we know how much Claire loves her time travel, so there you go. Just so get a zippy cup and... There you go, ready you're ready to, to party. So if you've got to go back to the future, make sure you do it in the zone. How good is that? Okay, we'll speak to you next time. <laughs> Bye for now.